and and I'm disappointed that we already know what the first two picks are going to be. And and it, it, if the first two picks aren't Trevor Lawrence to the Jaguars and Zach Wilson to the Jets, those will be the most stunning developments in the history of the draft because there's been no effort by either team to push back against all the momentum that's pointing toward Lawrence 1, Wilson 2. The draft begins at 3 and 4. The draft begins when we find out whatever the 49ers have had up their sleeve for the last month, assuming they know what they have up their sleeve. And there are some who say they still don't know what they have up their sleeve. And then whatever the Falcons plan at four. Peter, let's start with the Falcons at four. Because you and I have spoken a lot about it. You've written about it. You had some great stuff this week. They've got options. They've almost got too many options. Because at some point, you got to choose an option. It's like, let's make a deal. you got to pick one of those doors at some point. What do you think they're most likely to do? Draft a quarterback at four, take a guy like Kyle Pitts, or trade out of that spot? Mike, this is going to be an absolute guess because I give, I give tremendous credit to the Falcons. I really do. Because they got, two, they got a first-time head coach. They got a first-time GM. And those guys basically have kept a very good lid on what they're going to do. Um, my gut feeling is that if they get an offer that is even representative, that they will trade down. But that's all it is. It's just a gut feeling. Because I think they look at their team right now and, and you know, you ask yourself this question. Okay, if we pick Justin Fields or Trey Lance or maybe Mac Jones, if he is not number three. If we pick one of those quarterbacks, then we're going to feel very good about him to be our quarterback for the long term. But now we have to deal with Matt Ryan over the next two years and this colossal amount of money that he's owed. And, and, and so, you know, we still have that thing about we haven't really improved our team for 2022 or 2021 and probably 22. And in my opinion, if you're Terry Fontenot and you're coming into this team, you see holes on this team that you want to fix. And I believe that if they have an opportunity to get a, an extra one next year by moving down a few spots and how much is a few, I don't know. But if they have that opportunity, you ask me my gut feeling, what I think they're going to do, I don't know what they're going to do. And that's the honest truth. But that is what my guess would be that they would do. And if they stay right where they are, uh, I would think they're going to take Kyle Pitts. And, and you, you make an excellent point in that it's so critical to keep your cards close to the vest and let no one know what you're really thinking. Because at the end of the day, what you have to do is sell that pick to your fan base, to the media that covers your team. And it's so important to be able to say, we got the guy we wanted. And one way to make it clear that you got the guy you wanted is to never say who you wanted. So then whoever you get, and, and look, lying's a big part of the football business. And I think that it blurs the line as to where lying is no longer permissible. But when it comes to PR, it wouldn't surprise me if a team that didn't get the guy it wanted said, we got the guy we wanted. And if you don't tell anyone in advance who you want, it's plausible. And the best case scenario for the Falcons, Peter, would be to trade down and still get the guy they wanted. If you go down just a few spots, step aside for somebody to come get Trey Lance and still get the guy you would have taken if you'd put a name on the card at that spot and you pick up more draft capital, that's a home run for the Falcons. And whether it's true or not, they've preserved the ability, if they do trade down, to claim, hey, that's the guy we would have taken at number four. <laughs> hey, look, you know, if you look at where this draft is right now, okay, uh, I don't think Cincinnati is going to trade up to number four. I mean, they're not, okay? I don't believe Miami is trading up to number four. And I don't think Detroit is trading up to four. I think if Detroit goes anywhere, it's down. And then look at the next pick, Carolina. Do you think that the first big move in the history of uh, the new Atlanta Falcons uh, 
you know, general manager and coach <laughs> that they want to hand a quarterback to a division rival for the next 15 years? I doubt it. So to me, you know, when you talk about trading down, to me, that means one team. That means the Denver Broncos. I can't envision the Patriots denuding the next two drafts to move from 15 to 4. I certainly can't imagine Washington or Chicago at 19 or 20 moving up that many. And But I wouldn't be shocked if the Broncos did it. Yeah, I agree with you. They're not happy with Drew Locke, new general manager and George Payton, who's going to have an idea of who he wants at quarterback. And Locke, even though Sims and I believed in him tremendously, not healthy enough, not consistent enough, and at risk of being bounced in favor of someone if they can move up and get a guy like a Lancer if a Justin Fields would end up in their laps. All right, you mentioned the Bengals at five. They never trade up. They never trade down. They never do anything that makes it fun, and that's fine. Small C conservative are the Cincinnati Bengals in many ways, and I think that everything points to Penny Sewell. I think it points so clearly to Sewell at five that you have to – be aware of just the incremental risk that somebody tries to get to four to get Sewell because I think it's bright line Bengals Sewell at five. Am I wrong? Um, well, I would have said a few days ago, no, you're not wrong. I think they're going to take Sewell. I could still give him Sewell. My mock draft comes out on Monday. That'll be, that'll be one of my final calls. But I think there's two things at play here, Mike. Number one is that the Bengals have always liked, you wouldn't think of this because Mike Brown is so conservative. The Bengals have always really fancied themselves an explosive offense. You go back to when I started covering the team, believe it or not, in 1984, Chris Collinsworth and David Verser, you know, the, you want, at, at the time, in the early 80s, everybody said, why are they taking so many receivers so high? They got Isaac Curtis. That is what Paul Brown believed. He kind of passed it on to his son. So the only thing that I say in this is that they saw, you know, uh, two years ago at LSU, Joe Burrow throw to Jamar Chase for 1,700 yards and 20 touchdowns. And they saw all this, they've watched all the tape, and they've seen them make beautiful music together. There's no question that Joe Burrow has talked up Jamar Chase inside that building. And and so all I'm saying is that if I had to put a name down right now, 8, 11 a.m. on Friday, April 23, I would put Jamar Chase. And add to that, Mike, there are probably six good second round tackle prospects that the Bengals could get with their second pick in this draft. So I view them going right now, wide receiver, tackle, guard with their first three picks. You mentioned Collinsworth. Burrow was on Collinsworth's podcast earlier this week, and he was very diplomatic. He was very tactful when speaking about that pick and Shereen Williams picked up on it because she said, you know, last year you had Kyler Murray stumping publicly for C.D. Lamb to be drafted by the Arizona Cardinals, even though they had just traded for DeAndre Hopkins. But college teammate, I got to take a stand for my guy. She read it as maybe he doesn't really want Chase or he would have said something. Maybe next level is he said everything he needs to say behind the scenes and he's made his message clear and there's no need to go public and say, I want Jamar Chase, I want Jamar Chase. Maybe he knows. Maybe he knows if he really wants Jamar Chase, he's getting Jamar Chase. I mean, he's the one who's not going to have the benefit of Panay Sewell to keep him from getting injured again. If he wants Chase, at a certain point, if I'm Duke Tobin, if I'm Mike Brown, if I'm anyone in that organization, this is the guy I'm building around. You want Chase over Sewell, all right, let's make it work. Mike, I, I, hey, I respect Shereen greatly, but I would, I would disagree with her in this regard. You know, we now, in the sports media, have sort of known Joe Burrow for maybe a year and a half, okay? Ever since he really started getting great at LSU, all right? In that year and a half, has Joe Burrow ever said anything? Ever. 
Has he said anything? No. He is a just the facts, stay in my lane. That's not my job. I read what he said and I listened to the Collinsworth podcast uh, while I was taking a bike ride in beautiful Prospect Park, Brooklyn the other day. And I listened to the podcast and I thought it was so interesting because Chris is so folksy and down homey and everything and tried everything to get him to loosen up. And man, that guy, he doesn't loosen up very well. And that's, but that's just who he is. This is my job. I'm going to do my job. Duke Tobin, you have a job to do. I'm not telling you how to do your job. You pick the players that you think are best for the team. You know, and, and, and so that is, to me, that is who Joe Burrow is. And I respect that. I don't need to have him getting in somebody else's business. I honestly think that he views this as, hey, Duke Tobin, you do your job, I'll do mine. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.